Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Montgomery Blair Sibley. I'm the attorney for Larry Sinclair. And I just want to give you an overview of how we're going to proceed this afternoon. Uh, first, the National Press Club rents space. They do not condone or endorse the views of the people who rent the space. And we've been overwhelmed with people criticizing the National Press Club, and we just want to make it clear, Larry is here because he rented this room, and as a result, he's allowed to get up and say what he wants to say. The National Press Club has nothing to do with that. Uh, Mr. Sinclair is going to make a brief statement. You will be provided copies of that statement once he's done. And after that statement, he will entertain any reasonable questions and try to answer them. The procedure for doing that will be this microphone because we're being recorded and we want to make sure your questions are recorded so that uh, we get a full question and answer for the video that's being made today. I will come around the room. I will not give you the microphone, but I will hold the microphone so you can um, ask your questions. And um, at the end of that statement, at the end of the questions, Larry will be leaving the room. Uh, with that said, Mr. Sinclair, the microphone is yours. Good afternoon. First thing I'd like to do is thank a very <coughs> personal thank you to Reverend Pastor James David Manning for showing up for his support. Thank you so much for being here. It means a great deal. Good afternoon. My name is Larry Sinclair. I'm a former recreational drug user, drug trafficker, and I'm a convicted felon for crimes of forgery, bad checks, and theft by check. But I'm also an American citizen. I love this country, and I cannot stay silent regarding Barack Obama knowing what I know. Today I will discharge my obligation as a citizen to witness this knowledge to you and raise questions for others to investigate and consider. I'm going to briefly describe my background and experiences with Senator Obama. In 1999, what appears to me to be a coordinated effort to discredit me, and finally a list of questions. After this brief statement, I will take and try to answer any reasonable questions. Please understand, I will respect your questions and try to answer them. I will not be disrespected, nor will you. My background, I'm 46 years old and I currently reside in Duluth, Minnesota. I am a U.S. citizen. I've made mistakes in my lifetime. I have been convicted and served prison sentences for writing bad checks, forging checks, using stolen credit card numbers in Arizona, Florida, and Colorado. These events occurred over 20 years ago, between 1980 and 1986. After going public on the internet with these claims against Senator Obama, earlier this year I became aware of a warrant out of Florida dated from 1986, which I have resolved, and it has now been dismissed. I also have an active Colorado-only warrant for alleged theft and forgery. I am not ignoring this warrant but am addressing it with the court in Colorado as well as with the district attorney's office. I have a pending motion to dismiss this warrant, which I am waiting to have calendared by the Colorado court. I have lived and worked under three different legal names. My birth name is Lawrence Wayne Sinclair. Later on, I have my name legally changed first to Lorai A. Silvas and later to Lorai Vizcarra Avila. Both name changes were conducted legally in the Pinal County Superior Court, Florence, Arizona. I legally returned to my birth name in the Fremont County District Court, Canyon City, Colorado in the year of 1997. In regards to the Obama incident, I flew out of Colorado Springs, Colorado to Chicago on November 2nd, 1999, arriving in O'Hare early in the morning of November 3rd. I went to the Chicago area to attend the graduation of my godson, my best friend's son, from basic training from the Great Lakes Navy Training Facility. I made reservations at the Comfort Inn and Suites in Gurney, Illinois, based solely on the location to the training center. On November 5, 1999, I hired the services of Five Star Limousine. <coughs> Excuse me. I had hired them both for November 5th and November 6th of 1999. On November 6, 1999, I asked the limo driver, whose name I now reveal for the first time, Jagir Parami Mutani, if he knew anyone who would like to socialize and show me Chicago. One note, there's a typo on the statement that you will get at the end of the statement, 
we will put an updated and corrected version on a website that you will also be given access to as far as the name is concerned. Mr. Mutani understood that I was looking for someone who knew Chicago and would enjoy socializing. Mr. Mutani said he knew someone who was a friend of his. On November 6, 1999, after picking me up at the hotel in Gurney, and this is significant, Mr. Mutani used his cell phone to make a call. That call was made to then Illinois State Senator Barack Obama to set up an introduction between myself and Senator Obama. Upon arriving at the bar and exiting the limo, Senator Obama was standing next to Mr. Mutani, and I was introduced to Senator Obama by name. Later that evening in a bar, which I believe was called Alibis, and I state believe because I have failed so far to get Citigroup to provide the credit card receipts that has the actual name. <coughs> I mentioned I could use a line or two to wake up. Senator Obama asked me if I was referring to Coke, and I stated I was. After stating I was, Obama stated he could purchase cocaine for me and then made a telephone call. This, too, is significant from a cell phone to a presently unknown individual during which Senator Obama arranged the cocaine purchase. Senator Obama and I then departed the bar in my limousine and proceeded to an unknown location where Senator Obama exited the limousine with $250, which was provided to him by me. Returned a short while later with an eight ball of cocaine, which he gave to me. I did ingest a couple of lines of cocaine, and shortly thereafter, Senator Obama produced a glass cylinder pipe and packet of crack cocaine from his pocket. Obama then smoked the crack cocaine. I performed fellatio on Senator Obama in the limousine during the time Senator Obama was smoking crack cocaine, after which I had the driver take me to my hotel, the Comfort Suites, Gurney, Illinois. The following day, November 7, 1999. Senator Obama appeared at my hotel room, unannounced, uninvited, where we again ingested cocaine and I again performed fellatio on Senator Obama. Significantly, both the driver's telephone call to Senator Obama and his call to the drug dealer should appear on the driver's and Senator Obama's cell phone billing statements. In the fall of 2007, September of 2007, I contacted the presidential campaign of Barack Obama to request solely that Senator Obama publicly correct his stated drug use record to, flex, <coughs> excuse me, to reflect his use of crack cocaine with me in November of 1999. When I made the first contact, I left with the presidential campaign of Senator Obama a telephone number for the campaign to return my call. The first number I provided was a Texas cell phone number. From the period of Labor Day weekend 2007, through November 18th of 2007. I did provide a total of four different callback numbers to the Obama campaign. As I had moved and I had changed the numbers to, to reflect locally my place of residence at the time. In late September to early October, <coughs> excuse me, I lost my place here. In late September to early October 2007, I received a call from a male who identified himself as a Mr. Young stating he was calling in regards to calls I had made to the Obama campaign. This first call was in fact an attempt by Mr. Young to obtain from me the identities of anyone I contacted concerning my 1999 allegations against Senator Obama. This first call shocked me in that this Mr. Young asked me why I had, <coughs> excuse me, why I had never mentioned to the camp shocked me as I had never, whoa, hold on, so I'm lost here. Thanks, because this is getting, I can't even see it. The first call was in fact an attempt by Mr. Young to obtain from me the identities of anyone I contacted concerning my 1999 allegations against Senator Obama. The first call shocked me in that this Mr. Young asked me why I had not asked Senator Obama to disclose the sexual encounters I had with Mr. Obama in 1999. I was shocked as I had never mentioned to the campaign or anyone working for the campaign any sexual encounters as my call was prompted by drug allegations only. The call ended with Mr. Young stating I would hear from someone in a few days. I would hear from someone in a few days. 
In mid to late October 2007, I received a second call from this Mr. Young, at which time I clearly became aware that this individual was personally involved with Senator Obama rather than just an employee of his campaign. The tone of the conversation had a sexual nature. Mr. Young did not once advise me how he obtained my phone number, which by this time had now changed to a Delaware number. In late October 2007, I received a text message from the gentleman identified as Mr. Young, in which he stated he was intimately involved with Senator Obama and that Obama was discussing with him and his pastor how to publicly acknowledge Senator Obama's drug use in 1999 and that Obama wanted to be sure I had not discussed the sexual encounters or drug incidents with any media at that time. In mid to late November 2007, in another text message from Mr. Young, he advised me that Senator Obama will publicly correct his statement as to the last time he used drugs, and I did not need to concern myself with publicly disclosing it myself. The last contact I had with Mr. Young was in early December 2007 when he made it clear to me that Senator Obama had no intentions of publicly acknowledging his 1999 use of crack cocaine and that Mr. Young was in fact doing nothing more than milking information from me for Senator Obama's use. I later learned that A. Donald Young, the choir director of Reverend Wright's Trinity United Church of Christ, Obama's now former church, and who was openly homosexual, learned that he was murdered on December 23rd of 2007. I have cooperated with the Chicago Police Department on this matter by providing them the telephone numbers I was using during the fall of 2007. And I release them now publicly in the hope that someone may be able to connect the dots between these telephone numbers and Mr. Young. Those numbers are 954-758. Actually, that should be 956. That's another typo. 956-758-1105-956-758-1885-956-758-8002-302-685-7175-612-466-1043. In what I now realize was a naive and uncounseled decision I posted in January 2008 a video on YouTube where I related the above information regarding my liaisons with Senator Obama in 1999. The response was overwhelming, and I quickly became the recipient of what in hindsight appears to have been a coordinated attack on my character with ever-increasing falsehoods circulating on the Internet. In response, I agreed to take a polygraph test sponsored by WhiteHouse.com. The results of that test have been partially revealed to end to the end of labeling me a liar and taken as gospel by all. <clears throat> I'd like to make the following comments about that polygraph test. First, I have been subsequently advised that WhiteHouse.com was a website dedicated to anti-Clinton pornography until earlier this year. In fact, until 2000, January of 2008 to be exact. Second, I have now come to understand that lie detectors are junk science at best, which is why courts of law refuse to use them. Third, a review of the results by a George W. Matchik, Ph.D. of antipolygraph.org, raises serious questions about the legitimacy of this particular examination. Indeed, overlooked by almost everyone is that WhiteHouse.com's own examiner, Dr. Gordon Barlin, Salt Lake City, Utah, observed that on the drug question regarding Senator Obama, that the computerized score found that there was less than 1% probability of deception by me. That's about as high a passing score as one could possibly obtain. Finally, in February 2008, I was told anonymously that Dan Parisi of WhiteHouse.com received $750,000 from the Obama campaign through David Axelrod's AKP Media and Message One, or Message and Media, I think, to organize an effort to publicly discredit me. When I confronted Dan Parisi with this allegation, he did not deny it, but instead withdrew the second exonerating polygraph report of Dr. Gordon Barlin, 
failed to post the video of my polygraph, as he and WhiteHouse.com promised they would do, and even removed posts from their website altogether, claiming that I had had enough of the attacks by Sinclair's supporters and Sinclair himself, quote, unquote. The polygraph results, as misrepresented, were immediately seized upon by the blogger community, and I became the subject of vicious lies about me. I was forced to file a lawsuit in an attempt to stop those lies about me that had been circulating. That lawsuit sought to obtain the proof of what I was saying about my contact with Senator Obama through subpoenas for the identities of the anonymous bloggers so they could be linked to the Obama campaign and relevant records of the cell phone companies to prove the truth of my allegations. To date, though the lawsuit is now over 90 days old, Judge Henry Kennedy has refused to permit the suit to move forward so this evidence may be obtained. In conclusion, in sum, you can discredit my story and then you can make your decision on who should be next President of the United States. The burden is now off of me, as I have told my story without the distortions that, I've been intentionally heaped, that have been intentionally heaped on me, and what my lawyer tells me is an ad hominem attack. Shoot the messenger so you don't have to hear the message he is bringing. I'm now done. It's for others to find the corroborating evidence of my story by locating the limousine driver, Mr. Mutani, by checking the telephone numbers related to Donald Young and Senator Obama. I leave you with these questions that I've asked of Senator Obama, but in which he, re of course, refuses to answer. Who wants to be the next president of the United States has refused to answer. Number one, why won't Senator Obama provide his cell phone numbers and telephone records for all his personal and official cell phones held by him for the time period of no more than November 3rd through November 8th of 1999 when we met? Two, why won't Senator Obama provide his cell phone numbers and telephone records for all his personal and official cell phones held by Senator Obama for September 2007 through December 23rd of 2007, the murder of Donald Young? Three, why won't Senator Obama provide all email communication, both personal and campaign related to and or from AKP Media and Message from January 18th, 2008 through February 29th of 2008 for Senator Obama, David Axelrod and David Plu? Fourth, why won't Senator Obama provide proof of all payments made from AKP Media, <clears throat> Obama for America, David Axelrod, David Plu, and Senator Obama's accounts for the period of January 18th, 2008 through February 29th of 2008. On a website that we posted the, today, LarrySinclair.org, you will find the documents that I have referred to in the statement. A copy of the home page for that website is attached. And he's, Mark's going to be passing them out. Thank you for the time and your attention this afternoon, and I will now take any questions. Test one, two, three. Just got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Sinclair, could you explain why, if this incident happened in 1999, you waited until 2007 or 2008 to come forward? It's a question of credibility, sir. Why did you come forward back in uh, 1999 or 2000? Well, number one, in 1999, I really didn't care whether he was a senator from Illinois or not. To be honest with you, I wasn't a resident of Illinois. Um, as far as why now, um, I was living in Mexico up until 2006. It really was of no interest to me. I know plenty of politicians, both locally and internationally, that you know are pretty much crooked. Um, the whole issue was based on his drug use and his claim that he had not used drugs since his college days, and that was the whole issue that brought this forward. Next question, sir. Are you receiving any uh, financial support for your efforts from anyone? And if so, does that, do any of those people have connections to the Republican Party? I can, I'm glad you asked that question. Number one, I am not connected with any party, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, Democratic, none nor are anybody that are contributing to the cost and the expense of this. Every penny that has gone to pay for this press conference, my travel expenses, have come from average American citizens, most of them actually, according to their own statements, are declared independents, in the sums of from $12.31 to $100. Question, yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> 
Mr. Sinclair, can you explain why, if this incident happened in 1999, you waited until 2007 or 2008 to come forward? It's a question of credibility, sir. Why didn't you come forward back in uh, 1999 or 2000? Well, number one, in 1999, I really didn't care whether he was a senator from Illinois or not. To be honest with you, I wasn't a resident of Illinois. Um, as far as why now, um, I was living in Mexico up until 2006. It really was of no interest to me. I know plenty of politicians, both locally and internationally, that you know are pretty much crooked. Um, the whole issue was based on his drug use and his claim that he had not used drugs since his college days, and that was the whole issue that brought this forward. Next question, sir. Are you receiving any uh, financial support for your efforts from anyone? And if so, does that, do any of those people have connections to the Republican Party? I can, I'm glad you asked that question. Number one, I am not connected with any party, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, Democratic, none nor are anybody that are contributing to the cost and the expense of this. Every penny that has gone to pay for this press conference, my travel expenses, have come from average American citizens, most of them actually, according to their own statements, are declared independents, in the sums of from $12.31 to $100 each. David Hutchins, American News Project. What is Veritas Federal Media, and what role do they have in uh, this renting this venue and the camera crew in back? The media company you just requested, what is it? It's exactly what I just answered this gentleman. It represents every individual person. It's not a company, in all honesty. It was established as an email address when I arrived here for the Democratic National Committee's bylaws and rules. Rules and bylaws? Okay, I did. I did. Okay. It's not a company. It is nothing more than a name to represent all of the individuals across this country that have helped get this story out. Would you be willing to, um, would you be willing to share your mental health records with the public? Actually, I'm going to post later this afternoon a list of all of my doctors going back through all of my medical records that are available through 1999. Anyone with valid, legitimate press credentials that wants to check my mental health history, I will be more than willing to sign an authorized medical release for that purpose. Huh? More than 30 minutes. More than 30 minutes of what? Well, actually, if, you, uh, if, if you're valid press and you want me to release my psychiatric records, I'll release them to you as long as you pay for them. I have nothing to hide. Well, it was a joke. It was about McCain and the 30-minute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you can tell where I'm at today. <laughs> uh, yes, Mr. Sinclair, uh, uh, will you state uh, whether you had sexual relations with any other politicians here today? Actually, Your name I has come up with Larry, uh, Senator Larry Craig. For the record, I have not been engaged or involved with any other politician. In fact, at the time that I met Senator Obama, I had no idea that he was actually in Illinois politics. Behind you. Why did you change your name so often? Well, first of all, in my younger years, I was considered like, uh, you know, wild. Um, and it was more out of respect to my family, because uh, as you can see with everyone putting my past history all over the place and misdorting it. Um, I changed my name the first, actually the first two times I changed my name was while serving prison sentences in Florence, Arizona. Um, you said that uh, he was introduced to you by name you didn't know he was uh, an Illinois politician. And why would he be introduced by his true name to you and you would know that he was a politician over the years? How, how did you realize that it was him? I mean, because if he's going to engage in sex and drug taking and he's a renowned politician in Chicago, it strikes me as a little bit strange that they give you his real name through a limo driver. I mean, that, that story doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And how would you remember for 10 years uh, when you leave the way and, and then recognize him on TV, or, or how? 
Okay, first of all, yes, he was introduced to me by name, okay? He was introduced to me as Barack Obama. And as far as me not knowing that he was a politician locally, I wasn't a resident, hang on, I was not a resident of Illinois. When I became aware of exactly who he was, was when he gave the keynote speech at the Democratic National Convention in 2004 while I was living in Mexico watching it on Sky TV. No. I did not say that. I told you he was, in fact, introduced to me by name. I have always stated that he was introduced to me as Barack Obama by the driver and by Barack Obama himself, sir. Always. Hey, Larry, uh, how much did this whole event cost you? And what, what are you doing now for a living? Well, uh, as far as anybody wanting to know, the final expenses I would have to check because I've had a few things changed in the last 24 hours. But as of Monday morning, I think it came to a total of $4,126.89. And what I do for a living, I am disabled <clears throat> permanently due to severe nerve damage and spinal injuries. And believe me, it's killing me standing up here this long, but I'll take the question anyway. Jim Malone with the Voice of America. Given your criminal record, uh, the fact that the crimes that you've been involved in involve deceit and fraud, uh, why is it that you think that anyone would believe what you're saying now? Well, to be honest with you, it's not so much whether you believe me or not as much as you hear me. Okay? I mean, it's not my intention to convince you. Uh, first of all, I'm not going to defend my lifestyle for the last 46 years. I've made mistakes. Um, but I've always admitted to anything I've done, including these crimes. Okay? Uh, I can't tell you why to believe me other than the fact I'm not, in fact, I'm not saying believe me. I'm saying, you know what, here's the information. Look at it, do your own research, but do it based on the facts. Stop doing it based on this constant misinformation and misrepresentation that's been circulating on the Internet. I'm going to give you everything in writing and you make your own decision. Um, what, what, what time did you meet him on November 6th and what time did he arrive at your hotel in Gurney uh, the day following? We met in the early evening on November 6th. As far as a specific time on November 7th, I cannot provide that to you. And I know where that question is coming from, but I cannot provide that to you. You know where it's coming from. Thank you. How, when, and where did you incur this uh, permanent disabling uh, nerve and spinal injury? Sacramento, and, and Cali Sacramento California. Uh, injuries from October of 2000 through August of 2001 while employed with B&G Delivery Systems on Harris Avenue in Sacramento, California. And, and what is your uh, source of income now? Is that my source of income? My, compensation? Or? My source of income is disability, Social Security disability. That's your sole source of income? That is. Um, we all recall the claims and counterclaims and what happened with the Clinton um, allegations vis-a-vis -vis Monica Lewinsky. Can you offer any physical evidence, any identifying physical features and so on that can support your claims? I have already announced that I would identify certain physical features, but I will not do it at this time. It will be posted later at the advice of my attorney after we've discussed the specifics. One, and then one slightly longer one. Did you save any of the text messages? The text, mess oh, the text messages, I've contacted Sprint Nextel, and the changing of the phone numbers, they actually have the procedures that they can recover the text messages from those numbers, but they do not stay on the phone when the numbers are changed. And then when you were discussing your, the results of your polygraph, you first impugned the, the uh, veracity of the test by saying that it was, quote, junk science. But then a few moments later, you said you scored very well in one respect. So I'm, I'm, it's unclear whether or not you actually are staking some of your claims on the polygraph. No, actually, as far as I'm concerned about the polygraph, I'm not saying that it's good or it's good or it's bad. 
I am saying from the day that it was done and the day after, once I returned home, I was asked questions about the procedure and the process. And I had had a, a polygraph done once before, <clears throat> back in the 80s. And I specifically instructed the examiner, I knew darn well you didn't put the blood pressure cup and the, uh, whatever on the fingertips on the same hands. And he was advised of the nerve damage and the fact of the circulation, and I have bilateral ulmar nerve entrapment in both arms. All right, uh, I can't tell you how they did it. I will tell you that his report from Dr. Gelb to the report to Dr. Bartlin completely contradict each other. The information from Dr. Gelb, who is not a doctor at all, was never sent in totality to Mr. Barlin. I cannot tell you. I'm telling you that this gentleman with antipolygraph.org, these are his opinions. These are his findings. These are not mine. Okay. I have said all along that the polygraph, I did not feel comfortable with the way it was done. Um, a couple of questions. Um, First of all, given that you've got this record in the past of taking so many drugs yourself, why do you care whether, he take it, whether he's taken it? And secondly, um, he seems like quite an interesting person to spend a couple of days with. Between the fellatio and the drug taking, what did you talk about? I'm sorry? Between the fellatio and the drug taking, what did you chat about? Actually, pretty much uh, nothing other than the fact of what I was doing for a living, what I was doing in Chicago. Like I said, the, the entire conversations that we had were pretty basic and casual. His uh, comments as far as what he did for a living, he never once acknowledged being a politician. In fact, he specifically stated he was in public service. You know, uh, with my view, public service can mean just about anything. What was the other part of the question? Do you care so much? You Why do I care? I care so much because this political season has, has turned, you know, this country upside down. To be honest with you, we have gone back, I would say, a good 50 years in this country on race relations alone over being called racist if you ask a candidate who chose to run for president. I'm not sure if you remember, but this country had a very nice lady in the state of New York by the name of Shirley Chisholm that uh, once sought the nomination of the Democratic Party. And this was back, I think, in the late 60s, early 70s. And here was a true African American who you could ask her questions based on her record, on her credentials, on her beliefs, and you would have never been called racist. Today, you know, I'm, tell, I'm speaking the truth about his own actions. You know, these aren't mine. I'm not running for office. And now all of a sudden you're called racist or bigot? I'm sorry, that's why I care. You have to face the facts. Somebody's going to have to ask him, are you going to wait until, you know, the election's over and then start vetting your presidential candidates? Actually, I'm wondering, Mr. Sibley, why you decided to take this on. Um, and, and it's been reported that you've been disbarred in the state of Florida. Um, I'm wondering if you're, you're a part of the bar in D.C. I'm happy to answer those questions as I expected they would come up. I have been suspended by the Florida Supreme Court on March 7, uh, 2008, and the suspension was a result of me being too litigious and allegedly not paying uh, child support. Uh, that matter is now pending at the United States Supreme Court. But as a result, I have been reciprocally dis uh, suspended by the District of Columbia Bar and the Federal District Court in the District of Columbia without an opportunity for a hearing or an opportunity to present my side of that story. There is on the website 147 pages which documents what's going on in my particular professional life, and it really isn't the subject of what's going on here today. But uh, if you're curious, you know, it's a good read, and I, I encourage you to read it. Is, it. is it fair for me to inquire about the kilt also? <laughs> you, cer you certainly can. I, I know it may seem odd to you, but I don't know why men wear pants. But I think it's a, it's a function of male genitalia size, and if you're normal to small, <laughs> Pants probably aren't uncomfortable, but those of us at the other end of the spectrum find them very, uh, very binding. Excuse me, can I say something on your question to the kilt? <laughs> just, just that, just. Actually, I asked him to wear a suit and tie, and he says, "Why should he be uncomfortable?" And I said, "Because you're paid to be uncomfortable. Look at me." <laughs> a little more seriously, though, um, I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, at a very human level here, it's obviously you have tremendous credibility problems, including fraud and deceit. Um, there is, there are questions about you. It's, it's very hard, I think, for uh, probably some of us in the audience to take this whole situation 
uh, seriously. So the question again is, why are you doing this and how can you expect us to take this seriously? I'm, gonna, I'm glad you asked that and I'm going to tell you how I expect you to take it seriously. I expect you to ask me questions and I expect you to do your job and actually find facts as opposed to looking at Daily Kos or Fire Dog Lake or uh, Huffington Post or all of these pro-Obama sites that are putting and twisting. Sir, I have not hidden from anything I have ever done in my life. Never. You can go back to the judges in any one of my cases and they will tell you I have never wasted a taxpayer dime on a trial or even a preliminary hearing. If I did it and I got caught, I said I did it, okay? And I understand you asking about my credibility. You know what? My crimes were 20 some odd years ago, with the exception of the alleged crime in 2001, which I have not ran from, even though I'm being portrayed as hiding and running. I'm not, okay? That's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to actually get facts and then make your decision rather than fake Washington Post articles saying that I've been investigated eight times over 25 years for blackmail against politicians, which is not true, but yet you're continuing to repeat it over and over again. Even though it's been proven not to be true, it doesn't matter. It's what is continuously being recycled out there. As long as you tell the truth, which I'm doing, you can talk about anything about my past that you want to. I don't, it doesn't bother me. I admit to it. You know, you can't live your life and then run and hide from it later. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> well, you say this, you want us to get facts, but uh, most of what you're alleging is difficult to corroborate. I mean, would the limo driver have have witnessed the the crack smoking and the fellatio, or is that was it, were you and Obama the only people? That Mr. Mutani actually does have uh, personal. Uh, knowledge of the actions and the transactions that took place in the limo. Let me explain something to you. I was actually in contact with Mr. Mutani in the first part of this year. Since posting the YouTube video um, and the vicious attacks on the internet and the allegations that are constantly circulating out there that nobody bothered to fact check before they continue to post them, this driver has decided and his family's decided it's like all of a sudden they want to, you know, disappear. It's my understanding that Mr. Mutani's family was in Tupelo, Mississippi, as recently as three weeks ago. I do know that there were public records at one time, and where those public records have uh, disappeared in a couple of weeks, because we had a private investigator down there actually going through public records that were verified just two months ago, and now all of a sudden they're not there. A few questions. Uh, one, would you make all of your financial records available to the public and to reporters? I mean, I guess a lot of us probably feel suspicious <laughs> of the way you're, you finance a National Press Club event, the way you pay for a private investigator to go to Tupelo, Mississippi. Um, I, I have no problem with that whatsoever in posting my financial records. And a follow-up question. Um, the Veritas uh, Media Group, I understand that, uh, that um, Joseph Giganti has no sir. any connection. Okay. Um, but uh, it, it seems awfully odd that, that he would be, you know, the spokesperson for Alan Key's, uh, you know, political campaign, that your, your organization would be called Veritas. You know, it's, it sounds awfully like a, a red herring, or uh, what, are your, what are your comments on that? The name was just, to my knowledge, the name was just drawn out of a hat. This is not something that was done. First of all, Mr. Yadanti, as, as far as I know, has no connections with me. I've never met the man. I've never had any communications with him whatsoever. Um, and he definitely does not finance me. Um, and he has not financed this event. Okay. In fact, this event has been financed completely through contributions to PayPal. And I will, I will most definitely post those those contributions without the giver's name, of course. Why not the giver's name? Because why do, would you ask me to expose individual citizens of this country that contribute $25 here or $50 there? I mean, the maximum contribution that's been, uh, there's been one contribution of $1,000 and everything else is 500 or below. There's been one contribution of $1,000 and everything else is 500 or below. In fact, 99.9% .9 of it, I would say, is $100 or, or below. 
Uh, I understand you have a terminal brain tumor. Can you tell us what kind, in what lobe, and how that might affect your mental health? I will release my medical records when someone asks for a signed release. My tumor has been diagnosed, it has been confirmed, it has been verified by the Chicago Tribune, and I will not discuss my medical history at this point other than saying that there will be a list of my doctors up on LarrySinclair.org later this afternoon, and anyone interested in contacting those doctors for medical records can do so at your own expense. And I will release them. I have a question. Are you alleging that Barack Obama, Senator Barack Obama, has something to do with um, the um, murder or death of the gentleman you were talking about from his church? Mr. Young? Yes. It's my belief that that's exactly what, what has transpired, and that's why I have contacted the Chicago Police Department. It's also why I provided Detective uh, Robert McVickers with the information that he specifically requested. And yes, that's exactly what I'm alleging. I am definitely alleging that it is my belief, okay, that Barack Obama and Jeremiah Wright either knew who or had the person that killed Donald Young Kill. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And sir, I'm wondering if you could remind me which records you would like to have released um, by the Obama campaign. It sounded like the list was rather extensive and it spanned a number of years. Well, no, actually, the only thing we asked him to do was authorize the release, was to authorize the release of his cell phone records from uh, November 3rd to November 8th of 1999, and we would actually go for those records and obtain them if he uh, granted permission. The other records, I believe the only thing we're asking for is his email account records and cell phone records from, what, September 2007 through December 23rd of 2007, and uh, January 18th through February 29th of this year. Pardon, it's just, it's interesting. Wouldn't the right love to comb through those records, I'm sure, to see what they could find, even if it's completely unrelated to what you are saying here today? Well, first of all, I don't know who's referring to the right or the left, because I'm kind of like, you know, I'm one of those middle kind of people. I don't tend to fluctuate on either side. And as far as combing through those records, we've asked those records to be authorized to be released to us in a, in a federal civil case. And I have no intentions of disclosing his personal records. I mean, we're subpoenaed then want to subpoena them for evidence purposes, nothing else. Um, sir, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed the answer to this earlier. Uh, who is paying your, your fees? On Larry's website, there's a PayPal button to donate to his legal fund, which is me. And uh, I like Larry's uh, on other PayPal account. Uh, I've gotten maybe $5,000, nothing over $500, and most of them, like Larry's, are, are small ones. And we got a few checks in the mail, but nothing over $100. Exactly. Are, are you uh, in negotiations to uh, write a book or uh, any other paid media? Sir, and let me make this clear for everyone, I am not negotiating with anyone for any selling of stories, book publications of any kind, paid media appearances of any kind. What I want the media to do is to take the story, understand it, get the facts straight from me as opposed to the Internet, and you make your decision whether or not it's something that the American voter needs to, to be informed of. You do that, I'm done, okay? I have not attempted to make any money from this. I don't want any money from this. I don't even want any notoriety from this. I want people, to, I really want you to let this guy ask a question. Okay. I had a few questions. Uh, first of all, you said that you, were, you became aware when Obama gave a speech at the Democratic Convention. Why didn't you keep your cell phone records with when Mr. Young called you? Like, were you billed for the cell phone? Actually, the cell phone records, you need to understand something. My cell phone numbers at that time, and in fact, my cell phone currently, is through a division of Sprint Nextel called Boost. Those records are available to me online for a 45-day period. Now, they do have the records, and they actually have confirmed that, and I've agreed to have them. I've turn them over to Chicago Police Department and actually authorize their release to them, which they don't need me to authorize. I have personally contacted Sprint Nextel approximately two weeks ago. 
uh, asking that they dig up the records off of their system for each of those phone numbers from those periods and provide them to us. And I was instructed to make that request over a web form on the Sprint website. And if anyone here has Sprint or, or Sprint Nextel, you will know that Sprint is probably the worst cell phone provider company to deal with. But I will be getting them. And like I said, they have confirmed that those records are available. Are you, are you going to post those on your website as well? I will. And. Uh... Do you have, I mean, do you have the names of your best friend that you were visiting in Chicago? Has he testified or just said on the record that, yes, he was in town in Chicago because of my son? I will tell you this. John Crutzen from the Chicago Tribune should be able to confirm that that's been verified. I will not release my godson's name. Uh, not with the, the, the attacks that have been leveled against my family and my childhood friends in South Carolina. I'm not about to let you, uh, let these people do that to them. I will tell you the last name is Dukes. That's all I will tell you. D-U-K-E-S. All right. And last question. Your first YouTube video, you did say that the events took place between November 3rd and November 8th. And now you said that they started on November 6th. No, no, no. What I said was that I was in Chicago from November 3rd through November 8th. And see, this is, an, this is another incident of misrepresenting, you know, people twisting it. My statement was, while in Chicago, between November 3rd and November 8th of 1999, okay? I've always stated as far as dates, it would be November 6th and November 7th of 1999. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hello. Uh, this is a question for both of you. I just want to know, do either of you, what is your position on Barack Obama, whether or not he should be pres uh, president, and how do these allegations uh, inform your decision? That's between, me and, that's, that's between me and the voting booth, so I'll let Larry answer that. As far as me, I've always, made, I've always been straight up and I said, I've never told anyone not to vote for the man. In fact, I personally thought that he was somewhat uh, charismatic, you know, but uh, my, my whole thing is I don't prefer either one of the three, honestly. Hello? Senator Barack Obama is a charismatic person. Did you fall in love with him when you had sex with him in 1999? And secondly, what are your feelings to today? What are your feelings? Okay, first, no ma'am, I did not fall in love with Barack Obama. <laughs> but it's a good question because people have made that allegation. No ma'am. And uh, Barack Obama is only charismatic uh, you know, by being molded that way. All right. Once you take the teleprompters and the lights out from in front of them, you get a whole different person. And as far as my feelings now, those are my feelings. I think you're looking at someone that is completely fake, plastic, that has been made up and put out in front of the American voter, and that's been allowed to to walk away from any question, any serious questions about any of his own personal actions. That's what I think. Well, ma'am, nothing personal. Uh, okay. So I'm going to, okay, now I'm going to have to, and don't take this in a disrespectful manner, but let me ask you this. In your entire lifetime, you've never had a one-night stand? I mean, I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm, I'm, let's deal with reality here. Let's not act like, you know, uh, people go around and fall in love. I mean, that's the biblical way, but it doesn't happen. You were in touch with the limo driver. Can you detail that contact? Um, and did you save those phone records? I was in touch with the limo driver. And the contact was basically letting know that I had made public allegations on YouTube after having notified a reporter with the New York Post, who the Post had decided that it was just a little too hot for them to run with at the time. Uh, I was informed that if, in fact, the story broke and this individual felt that there was enough media coverage where he was safe, then he in fact would come out and cooperate those, those statements. It was just a little too hot for them to run with at the time. Uh, I was informed that if in fact the story broke and this individual felt that there was enough media coverage where he was safe, then he in fact would come out and cooperate those, those statements.
That's all I can tell you. What are you really up to? Uh, what kind of justice do you seek? And I think it's too early to impeach the president. Well, let me ask you this. You say it's too early to impeach the president, so you've already elected him. I thought that was the whole process of, of, of having an election in this country, of the candidate actually being vetted before the American public. Nothing personal, and believe me, this is not personal between me and Barack Obama. The only part of this that has become personal between me and the Obama campaign is the organized and orchestrated attacks against me and my family on the Internet. That's the only personal part. Outside of that, these are true statements. My thing is, what you just said, I think you want to ask your next president to be truthful with you and not put up a book that he claims, oh, I was a street kid who found my way later. But later is not quite 1999. That's all I asked him to do originally, was just admit that his drug use was still current as of 99. Okay? Claire, um, you said you first came to Washington um, with the uh, Democratic National Committee Rules Committee uh, session. Is that correct? Well, I originally came back. I originally came to D.C. the first time, I think, was May 28th was my arrival. That's correct. Right. Uh, at that time, uh, did you have any contact with anyone from the Hillary Clinton campaign? Are you referring to anyone that's official with the campaign or someone who's official, supports... or okay. official, official or unofficial? I've had no contact, to the best of my knowledge, with anyone that represents the, the Clinton campaign or any other campaign. As far as speaking with people who adamantly support Hillary Clinton, yes, I'm sure I've spoke to quite a few of them on that day. So you're saying to the best of your knowledge, you don't know if you spoke to To anyone. the best of my knowledge, I do not know. But there is a possibility that you could have. What I'm telling you, sir, is I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I didn't speak to someone because I may have spoken to one lady that, you know, represented themselves to be one thing, and I'm, that's catch-22, and I'm not going there. <laughs> I'll wind this up now with just a few more questions. So if anybody who has not asked a question wants to ask one first, we want to give them an opportunity. And then, this lady in the black. Can you tell us why you think that Obama and Wright are um, somewhat involved in the murder of the choir master? My entire opinion of that matter is based on phone conversations with the gentleman identified to me as Mr. Young. This person made it very clear that they were personally and intimately involved with Barack Obama. The first contact that was ever made between me and that person, that person initiated to my cell phone number, which was only left with the Obama campaign. And this person specifically made the statements that he um, was discussing uh, with, uh, Obama was discussing with him and his pastor on how to best deal with that situation. And then he ends up dead on December 23rd. That's how I'm saying it. And if I didn't answer it clear enough, let me know and I'll go back. <laughs> um, just one last question. Uh, well, I'm sort of wondering if there's any truth to the rumors that you're at all associated or have been contacted by the Bilderberg Group, but that's not my question. That's not my question. My question is, because I think we're all dying to know, especially Mr. Colbert. So. Was he well hung? Actually, I've always, I've referred to that. You know what, I'm going to answer the question the same way I always have. Barack Obama is a wannabe black man with a white boys, and that's where I'll leave it. Okay, we have a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, three more questions. How was uh, Donald Young murdered? Donald Young was actually shot execution style to the best of, to the best of my knowledge. However, it's my understanding from uh, discussions with the Chicago Police Department as well as from media accounts is that there was no forced entry. The door was closed. And I've always said that I believe Donald Young's murder was actually made to look like a copycat from a murder that was approximately one month earlier. Yes, I also read that there were three murders, gay murders. They all three were connected to Barack Obama's church. I know of a second individual that was murdered who's, who was in fact indeed a member of the choir 
Um, as far as the details to that one, I can't really go into it because I'm not that familiar with it. I do know that a Larry, I think it is, the name is Larry Bland, was murdered in November or early, late October, early November or something. And like I said, I believe that that was the murder that was used as a copycat to kill Donald Young. Nate Spencer that was uh, shot execution style and then just recently there was an article that came out that Nate died of an illness but then I saw uh, on his best friend's blog that it was an executed murder. Okay, and that's what I've tried to, I've tried to, I, what I have done on my blog, and I understand where you're coming from with this because I've been inundated with these questions and people have made allegations and I've tried to keep it simple. I cannot speak on Nate Spencer. I cannot speak on Larry Bland. I have asked everyone to actually get their facts correct before they post information regarding these individuals' deaths. I spoke on Donald Young's death because I'm familiar with exactly what happened and I believe I know who had it happen. In terms of sexual orientation, how do you identify gay, straight, bisexual? Who, me? I've been gay all of my life. Unfortunately, for some people who don't understand the lifestyle, I mean, I'm not one of those people who argue the point, you're born that way or you change that way. I've always been gay. I think we're at the questions at this point in time. And uh, Mr. Sinclair is now going to leave the room. I'll be out in a minute or two. If people want to organize the follow-up questions, I'll, I'll entertain them and I'll do that as best we can. Thank you for coming today. Thanks, guys.